Well, good afternoon and welcome to Maundy Thursday, the Thursday of Holy Week. Very glad that you all are joining us. Uh, just a reminder that this is the beginning of a period of the three days, the Triduum. It lasts from Maundy Thursday until Saturday evening when the three days comes to an end with the great vigil of Easter. Tomorrow night at seven, we will celebrate Tenebrae and hear again the story of Jesus' passion. And then on Saturday evening at seven, we will kindle the Easter fire and light the Easter candle and tell the story of God's saving action. So I hope you can join us for all of those special services. Again on Sunday, We'll be together at 8.30 and 10.30, uh, celebrating the Lord's Supper on Sunday as well. So be sure you have some bread and wine or grape juice with you. Again, tonight at 7 o'clock, we'll gather for our Maundy Thursday service. We will be celebrating communion. So this evening, some bread and wine nearby would be very helpful so that you can fully participate in the service. So Maundy Thursday... M-A-U-N-D-Y. I was a little surprised that some of my seminary classmates thought I had misspelled it, but that is in fact how it is spelled. It comes from the Latin word mandatum, which means commandment or mandate. Now I'm going to read you the first bit of Mark's story. We'll be going back and forth a bit today. This is from Mark chapter 14, and I'm reading verses 12 through 16. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus' disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city and found everything as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover meal. Now there is a great difference between Mark's gospel and Matthew and Luke's, the synoptics, and John's gospel. First of all, the dating is different. Mark tells us that Jesus gathers with the disciples to celebrate Passover. Mark says nothing about a Passover meal. What happens is different in each of the gospel stories. Mark speaks of bread and wine. John speaks of washing feet. But the commandment of Maundy Thursday, Mandate Thursday, Commandment Thursday, comes from John's Gospel and the new commandment. I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. Mark tells us that Jesus gave instructions for the preparation of the Passover. Again, like the entry into Jerusalem, it is well planned. It is not accidental or coincidental. The preparation has to do with secrecy. Only two of the disciples know of the preparations. If all of them knew, a traitor could have acted on the knowledge. The meal is too important to be interrupted. Now, a bit more of the story. Chapter 14, verses 17 through 25. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. And when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him, one after another, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, 
and after giving thanks he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. There are three main elements in Mark's story of the Last Supper. First, they eat a Passover meal together. Then Jesus speaks of his imminent betrayal. Then Jesus gives bread and wine new meaning, a meaning associated with his impending death. But that theme of failed discipleship that we talked about yesterday, that theme continues. More than half of Mark's narrative about from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane, more than half of it centers on the failure of the disciples, Peter, Judas, all. Now, the meal itself has four rich meanings. I'll probably preach a bit more about this tonight, so I'll kind of go fast. It's a continuation of the meal practice of Jesus. Sharing meals was one of the most distinctive features of Jesus' public ministry. It held both a religious and a political significance. Political because it affirmed a vision of a society of equals at table together. Religious because it affirmed God's provision of food for all. It's an echo of the feeding of the 5,000. The verbs are exactly the same in the way that Mark tells the story. Taking, blessed, broke, gave. Now this represents two divergent views. They're out there on the hillside, 5,000 people. The disciples say to Jesus, Lord, we can't feed them. Send them away. But Jesus turns it around and says to them, you give them something to eat. Not Jesus do it all for us. Jesus says, participate with me in this. The point of the story is not multiplication, but distribution. The food already there is enough for all when it passes through the hands of Jesus, the incarnation of divine justice. A shared meal for all present becomes both the great sacramental meal and the primary practical program of the kingdom of God. It's also a Passover meal. As our friends in the Jewish community began celebrating Passover last night, the Passover meal is a reenactment of the story of bondage, deliverance, and liberation. Blood from the Passover lamb was placed on the doorposts of the house, protection from the destroyer. They were to eat their roasted lamb and unleavened bread, dressed with their staff in hand, ready to go. It was food for the journey. The new Passover, the Lord's Supper, offers protection against death and food for the journey. And in case you missed it, yes, there is a very subversive tone to this story. Very subversive. The body and blood and the death of Jesus, that language is important for us to unpack for just a moment. The language of body and blood points to a violent death. Jesus separates the words body and blood. It bespeaks violence. And the reality of violence is important for Mark. Remember the lesson on sacrifice that we had? That the blood of the lamb would be put on the horns of the altar and the body of the lamb given back to the people as an invitation from God to eat? It's a lesson of God accepting and inviting us into a deeper participation by way of a meal. It is by participation with Jesus, by eating the bread and drinking the wine that we pass through death to resurrection, from the domination of life, of human normalcy, 
to the servant life of human transcendence. By eating the bread and drinking the wine, the body and the blood, we participate in Jesus' journey from death to life. It is about participation, not substitution. Now, let's read a bit more. A bit of a longer passage now. We're going to Gethsemane, verses 26 through 52. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You all will become deserters, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all become deserters, I will not. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But Peter said vehemently, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter, James, and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death, remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going, my betrayer is at hand. Immediately, immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man, arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to Jesus at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as if I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. So Jesus and the disciples go to Galilee, go to Gethsemane. Now, Gethsemane is not far from the city. It's at the foot of the Mount of Olives. You go out the ancient gate, and about a hundred yards away, you walk into the Garden of Gethsemane. Mark tells us that Jesus is distressed, agitated, deeply grieved even to death, and he throws himself on the ground in anguish. Jesus calls God Abba, a familiar term rather than the more formal Father, something like Papa. For daddy. Jesus prays for deliverance, not that God will intervene, but that he will have the strength in God in the midst of these most dire circumstances. And then the temple priest arrived, the crowd with clubs and swords. They're not the Roman guards as is often depicted in movies about the passion of Jesus. They were the temple guards and the temple was allowed, the, the priests were allowed to have a, a small police force, not really an army. And so they were the ones sent out to arrest Jesus. Judas is with them. And he identifies Jesus with the kiss because 
in all likelihood, the temple guards had no idea of who Jesus was. They were too busy watching massive crowds. Someone produces a sword and cuts off the slave of the high priest's ear. Failed discipleship, violence in the face of what Jesus taught as nonviolence, and the disciples scatter, they flee. Mark doesn't mention the disciples again until Easter morning. Judas betrays, the disciples flee, Peter denies, failed discipleship. Now let's go back to Mark, picking up in chapter 14, verses 53 through 65. They took Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests, the elders and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. But even on this point their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest asked, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of God and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy! And the guards also took over and beat him. Jesus is taken to the temple authorities. Now, we must not allow this to become a text of terror toward Jews. The people that were trying Jesus were the collaborators with the Roman authority, the priests, the scribes, the Pharisees. The witnesses called completely disagree with each other. They can't agree. And so the high priest takes over the questioning, interrogating Jesus directly. The questioning is not so much about Jesus personally, but about, to the, but about the challenge to the normalcy of the domination systems and empires and the normalcy of civilization itself. Jesus uses an interesting statement. Caiaphas, the high priest, says, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus says, according to the translation, I am. In Greek, the words are ego eimi, which can be translated, I am, or am I? A statement or a question? It's interesting that Jesus is convicted on the basis of what looks like a post-Easter confession, that he is the Messiah, the Son of God who will come again. And then we see the beginning of the physical and violent suffering through which Jesus will pass. Jesus is condemned to death. He is abused by members of the council and by the guard. And he is handed over to Pilate. Which takes us back into Mark's Gospel. We're reading chapter 14, verses 66 through 72. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But Peter denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what you are talking about. And he went out into the forecourt. Then the cock crowed. 
And the servant girl on seeing him began to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. Then after a little while the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you're a Galilean. But he began to curse, and he swore an oath, I do not know this man that you are talking about. And at that moment the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Not unlike Jesus, Peter is interrogated. But Peter responds with cowardice and fear. Jesus is interrogated and responds with courage and trust. Those who imitate Jesus are applauded for their courage. Think of the martyrs, ancient and modern. Those who imitate Peter are consoled with the hope of repentance and forgiveness. But here is Peter, another example of failed discipleship. I do not know the man. Betrayal, denial, fleeing, none of these are the worst sin. The worst sin is the loss of faith that forgiveness is possible. So that takes us from this evening to early tomorrow morning. And tomorrow afternoon at 2, we'll pick up the Good Friday story as Mark gives it to us. I'll pause now at the end of our time together and ask if you have questions or comments, send them through on the comment part of this page. Uh, it's the one that looks like a thought bubble that's up there in the corner or down there in the corner. And uh, let's see if there's anything on your mind. Comment. Well, I do hope you will join us tonight at 7. Have bread and wine or grape juice available. Crackers are fine. Whatever you might have, we'll join together in celebrating the new Passover. It's good to have you with us today. Have a good afternoon. We'll see you later on.